Let's, uh, let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Hebrews again. We were there last week, but we're going to begin there, and then we'll be going to some other places as well. But you can go ahead and start looking at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27. I read about a preacher who was visiting in Scotland. And uh, there in Scotland, he thought it would be interesting just to walk through some of the old cemeteries and just see the tombstones there and see what had been etched there, what kind of writings had been put uh, on the tombstones. And uh, he came across one tombstone that caught his eye in particular. And here's what it said. It said, pause as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you must be. So prepare yourself and follow me. That was kind of an interesting thought. But then somebody else came along and they, they kind of wrote underneath that. And here's what they wrote. To follow you, I'll not be content till I find out which way you went. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good words of advice there. You see, that second person understood something that is a very basic truth. The second person who wrote there understood what is clearly stated in the text verse that I mentioned a moment ago. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, there is a judgment. After this, there is a judgment. And the Lord Jesus, you remember, ended His revelation. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, He's, he's talking to, to the Apostle John. In Revelation 22, verse number 12, He says this. He said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So the truth that we need to understand is that God does have a reward. Uh, After we depart from this life, sometimes we hear people say they have gone to their reward, right? And so so there's coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day when, when God is going to, the Lord Jesus is going to come. He's going to bring His reward. He has a reward for every man. And and, then that kind of leads us to another truth that is, but it's very basic. You, you know this, but let me just remind you of it. Uh, in all of the world, there are only two types of people. In all of the world, there are only two types of people. First of all, there are those who are saved. They're, 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 they're children of God. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 13, they, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, they have been made to become sons of God. And so, and so there are those who are saved. But there's also those who are, who are lost. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 44, these are those who Jesus referred to as being spiritual children of Satan. So you're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. Those are the two types of people. There are no other, there are no other options. It, it's those two types of people. So with that in mind, I want us to consider the question, what about our rewards? Now, Jesus said, I'm bringing rewards for every man. Well, what are the rewards? What are the rewards for every man? Well, let's consider, first of all, the reward of the unsaved. The reward of the unsaved. Uh, In John chapter 15 and verse number 14, uh, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. But, But you remember the unsaved man is not God's friend. The unsaved man is not a friend of God. Rather, the unsaved man is a rebel. The, uh, the unsaved man is an enemy who has he's broken God's laws. He, he's offended God's holiness. He, he's refused to obey that most simple command. It's found in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. God commandeth all men everywhere to do what? To repent. He commands all men everywhere to repent. With that in mind, consider the words of the Lord God in Deuteronomy 32, verse number 41. Here's what the Lord said. He said, I will render vengeance to my enemies. 
I'll render vengeance to my enemies and will reward them that hate me. And and, and then in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 11, again, he says, Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him for the reward of his hands. That is the wickedness that he's done, the evil that he's committed in his life, the reward of his hands It will be given or it shall be given unto him. So we see this this reward for the unseen. I want you to notice a couple of things about it. First of all, let's consider the fulfillment of this. The fulfillment of it. When the unsaved man departs from this life in physical death, uh, you need to understand that his soul and his spirit will immediately go to a place of of fire. It goes to a place of torment. Uh, you're, you can read about it in Luke chapter 16 and the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember Lazarus uh, died, went to heaven, but the rich man died, opened up his eyes in a place of fire, in a place of torment, uh, in, in, a, in a terrible, terrible place. But But that is not, please understand, that is not the unsaved man's final destination. Okay? That's not the final destination. Uh, You see, the Bible says that this place where where that that rich man went in Luke 16, basically that is like a uh, what we would call today in the prison system. I've never been to prison, but, uh, but I've been told in the prison system they would call that a holding cell. And is that right? We have a police officer here. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. They they have a, they have like what they call a holding cell, and the holding cell is where a prisoner who has broken the law is put to await the day of his trial. He, he's put in that place to await their day in court. And according to the Bible, the unsaved man will have a day in court. It will come after the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. And it's the day that John the Apostle describes in Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and following, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. By the way, when it says, I saw the dead, that's those who are spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead in their trespasses and in their sin. And John says, I saw them there, the small and the great. That simply means the big shot and the little shot. They're all there. There are no exceptions. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's the final destination. That's the final destination. And this is the second death. It's the second death. I want you to notice that these people are going to be judged according to their works. They're going to be judged according to their works. See, they're they're going to be judged according to the things that they have done. Uh, all, all of the wickedness of their life. It's all, it's all on record. And they're going to be judged. The books will be open. They're going to be judged according to their works. And, and therefore, since all men's works are not equal, would we agree with that? I mean, we know some people who are just extremely wicked, ungodly people. We know other people who are just really nice people. But they're not saved, okay? Okay. So, so in this, in this judgment, the, the works are not going to be equal. The works are not going to be equal. And therefore, because of that, the Bible teaches that these unsaved in that day of judgment, they will not all suffer the same kind of punishment. They're not going to all suffer to the same degree. And that brings us to the second point, and that is the justice of this judgment. The justice of it. The Lord Jesus illustrated it when he talked about a certain servant. 
And he, and he said there was this servant, and, and here's what he said in Luke chapter 12, verse 47, verse 48. That servant which knew his Lord's will. He knew what he was supposed to do. He, he knew what God expected of him. He knew what God required of him. That he knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself. Neither did according to his will. Now notice what it says. That man shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not. He, he didn't know what was expected. He didn't know what was expected. Uh, he knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes. But notice it. He shall be beaten with few stripes. So, so God is going to be absolutely just. He's going to deal with every person on an individual case-by-case -case basis according to their works. According to their works. Bottom line, God's reward for the unsaved man is that they will be forever separated from God. Now that, that's, that's the fact. They're going to be forever separated from God. That's why it's called the second death. It, it, death is simply a separation. And so they're going to be forever separated from God and, and they will be forever tormented and they will be forever suffering to some degree as is determined fitting by the judge in that terrible place called the lake of fire. Now, I, I know that this is not a popular subject. I, I know this is something that, in fact, the truth is many, many, many preachers today they won't even talk about it. They, they want to focus on the love of God. They want to focus on the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the blessings of God, the, and all of those things. And, and so they totally ignore, they totally ignore the doctrines of God's holiness, and they ignore the doctrine of God's hatred for sin. They, they, they totally ignore that. They also ignore God's justice. And, and, and surely one of the needs of this day is we need, we need ministers, preachers, who, who are not afraid or not ashamed to stand up, kind of like the Apostle Paul. They're willing to stand up and courage, courageously present a balanced message declaring both the goodness and the severity of God. There needs to be the balance. There needs to be the balance. And, and so that's God's reward for the unsaved. And I hope that all of us here this evening have made sure of our salvation. I, I, I hope nobody in this room tonight will ever stand in front of this judgment for the unsaved. I, I hope that your calling and election is sure. I hope you've been saved by the grace of God. And so that's God's reward for the unsaved. But now let's move on quickly. Let's talk about God's reward for the saved. God's reward for the saved. As we consider the reward for the saved, there are a couple of points that we want to notice. First of all, the judgment. The judgment. And, and as we come through, uh, come through the New Testament, we come to Romans, for example. In, in Romans chapter 14, verse number 10, here's what it says. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now the unsaved were before the great white throne. We won't be there. But that doesn't mean we don't have a judgment. We are going to be judged as believers in Christ. And, and, and we're going to be judged at this judgment that is called the, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, again, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says again, for we, talk, talking about believers in Christ, he's writing to a church, and, and so he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good. In other words, we've done things that are good. We've done things that, what does that mean that we've done things good? That simply means we've done things that have glorified God. We, we've done things with the right motive, with the right desire. God has been glorified in what we've done. And so, and so whether it be good or, or whether it be bad, See, some people serve not to glorify God. They serve to exalt themselves. So, some people serve because they, they, they want something out of it, you see. The motive is all wrong. God knows the motive. He knows the intents of a heart. And so, see, all of that's going to come out at this judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us are going to stand before God, and we're going to give an account 
for ourselves. And this judgment is going to take place. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, you remember we said, takes place at the end of the millennial kingdom. This judgment takes place after the rapture of the saints. When we are caught up into heaven, that's when this judgment is going to take place. And so immediately after the Lord Jesus comes and takes us to our heavenly home, uh, we're going to face this judgment seat of Christ. And it's described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 13 and following. It says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now that's, that's a very important, let me stop right there. That, that, that's a very important point. It's going to try not how much work you have. No, what sort of work do you have? Is it work that truly glorifies God or not? What sort is it? That, that's the thing that's going to be looked at. That's the thing that's going to be on trial. So it's going to try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. So in this day, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and our works are going to go through the fire of God's judgment. He's going to try them to see what sort they are. Whether they come through the other side like gold and silver and precious stone. Or whether they all get burned up in the fire. Uh, it's all going to be judged. And, and, and the Bible says that if our works are burned up. okay, If our works are all burned up. We, we don't lose our salvation. We don't lose our salvation. But we do suffer loss. Loss of what? The loss of rewards. The loss of our rewards. That's why the Apostle John gives the admonition. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, he said, look to yourselves. That means examine yourself. Look in your own heart. Examine your motives. Examine your desires. Look, look in your own heart. Look to yourselves. Why? That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. That we receive a full reward. Well, what are these rewards? Let's notice letter B. The rewards. And they're called crowns in the Bible. And there are five of them that we want to mention for the next few minutes. First of all, there is, number one, the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 25, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Now if you read the context there, he's talking about, he's talking about athletes. And, and how that they, they train for their, for their event, whether they're a runner or, or whether they're a boxer or uh, whatever it may be, that, that they train and they're diligent in training. They, they're striving to get that, to get that prize, to get that little wreath that they would put on their heads when they would win an event or, or get that gold medal that they would hang around their neck. And, and they strive for that. They'll sacrifice themselves for that. They, they give up all of their fun time. They, 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 they give up all of the good food, that health food like pizza and Coca-Cola and, and all that good stuff. They, they give up all of that. Not because they don't like it, but because they have a higher goal. They want to be master. They, 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 they want to be the king of their event. They want to win the prize that is there. And, and they do that, Paul said, they do that to obtain a corruptible crown. But we're striving for a crown that is incorruptible. A crown that is incorruptible. In other words, this crown is for those who exercise godly self-discipline. This crown is for those who exercise godly self-control. Uh, this crown is for those who, who have learned to, to do as, as the Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. They have learned to deny himself 
and to take up his cross daily and follow after the Lord Jesus. This is the uncorruptible crown. This is, this is who will receive that crown. Uh, not only do we find the incorruptible crown, there's another crown, and that's the martyr's crown. The martyr's crown. Second uh, Timothy chapter chapter three and verse number twelve. The Bible says, "Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." All that live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. In, in, in Revelation chapter two, uh, writing to the seven churches, there, uh, here's what the Lord had to say. He said in Revelation chapter two, verse ten, "Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death." Now that doesn't mean be faithful until you die. That's not what that means. It's not what it means. Be faithful unto... That means you be faithful even if it costs you your life. You be faithful even if it means you're going to die because of your testimony and because of your faith. He says you be faithful unto death and I will give to you a crown of life. This crown is for those who by faith basically loved God more than they loved their own life. This crown is for those who, whose number one priority was, was God, His honor, His glory. The, these are those that we find mentioned in Hebrews 11, verse 36 to verse number 38. You can read about them. Men who for, of whom this world was not worthy, they suffered terrible things for the cause of Christ. You, you read about them not only in Bible times, but study church history. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read the testimonies of men and women and, and even teenagers who, who were willing to literally lay down their life, give it all up, because they would not deny Jesus Christ. They, they, they love God more. And, and the same thing, the same thing goes on sometimes in many places in our world today. Now, we don't realize that because we live in a place of safety. And, I, and I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. But, but, but there are many in the world today who pay the ultimate price for their faith. They pay the ultimate price. But there's another point that we could add up here, and James wrote about it in James chapter 1, verse 12 to verse number 15, when he wrote about the temptations that we have to sin. The temptations that we have to sin. And, and it was in that context that, that here's what he said. James chapter 1, verse 12. He said, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now, he's talking, about, he's talking about temptation to sin. Those desires, those wicked desires of the flesh that sometimes we encounter. And he says, blessed is the man that endures the temptation. For when he is tried, notice it, he shall receive huh, a crown of life. That's the same crown the martyr receives. He's going to receive a crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love Him. Give you a good example of this. You find it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. I make myself a martyr. I die to myself. I die to my desires. I die to my, my dreams. I, I would rather live for God than to live for myself. I love Him so supremely that, that He is my number one priority. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live by the faith of the Son of God. I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. See, bottom line, this crown is for those who would rather suffer and give up their physical lives than to deny Christ. And this same crown is also for those who are willing to deny their physical appetites and their physical lust and their physical desires rather than to sin against God. This crown, this crown of life. There's another crown that we find in the Bible, and that's the pastor's crown. The pastor's crown. The apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 to verse number 3, he, he spoke of those pastors who, who like a shepherd, are faithful 
and, and feeding the flock that God has given to them. They, 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 they don't act like a little dictator, a little demigod, you know, trying to boss everybody around and I'm in control, blah, blah, blah. No, no rather it's, it's like a shepherd. They, they lead by their example, not lords over God's heritage, but they lead by their example. And so faithfully they feed the flock, faithfully they lead the flock that God has entrusted to them. And, and then right after that, comes the promise. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear. Who's that? That's the Lord Jesus, right? Yeah. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. There's a special crown for the, for the faithful pastor, for the true pastor. There's also the righteous crown. The righteous crown. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul said uh, in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And I'm sorry, but you don't get one. No, that's not what he says, is it? No, he, he said, the Lord has laid up this crown of righteousness for me, but not for me only, but for all them that love his appearing. In, in other words, this crown is a crown that is given for all of those who are faithfully, as the Bible says in Titus 2, verse number 13, they are faithfully looking for that blessed hope. They're faithfully looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. These are those who live every day and every moment of every day with the expectation that Jesus Christ could come right now. I, I, I want to be found when He comes. I, I don't want to be found somewhere where I should not be as a Christian. I, I don't want to be found doing things I should not be doing as a child of God. When, when Jesus comes, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be found doing something that is, that is inappropriate or something that is wrong. And, and, and the reason that this is called a, a crown of righteousness for those who are faithfully looking for the coming of the Lord, the reason it's called a crown of righteousness, it's explained for us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and verse number 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Doth not appear, doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now notice this next verse. And every man that hath this hope in Him does what? He purifies Himself, even as He is pure. You see, the truth of the matter is the crown of righteousness is given to those who are looking for the coming of Christ because those who are really looking for the coming of Christ, expecting that He could come at any minute, they're going to be guarding their hearts they're going to be guarding their actions. They're going to be guarding their words. They want to make sure that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, they will be found pure before Him. Crown of righteousness. Crown of righteousness. And then number five, there's the soul winner's crown. The soul winner's crown. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 30, it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that win his souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that win his souls is wise. And, and then over in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, verse number 3, they that be wise. Okay. Who are the wise? The soul winners. And they that be wise, notice what it says, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So therefore the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? By the way, I want you to notice something uh, kind of interesting here. The Apostle Paul does not actually say that he's going to receive a crown. Although it is suggested 
It doesn't actually say he's going to receive a crown. What he said was, is the people that he won to Christ, they were his crown. The people that he had won to Christ, they were the ones, they are his crown. When he meets those people he has won to Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, and, they, and, and, and to know that they are there, they are there as a child of God because he was faithful. Wow, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing that will be. These are the rewards. There's the judgment. There's the rewards. But then I want you to know there's another thing that goes along with this, and that is the privilege. The privilege. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 10, we read about four and twenty elders. Now you remember in the book of Revelation, it's basically divided into three parts. There are the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be. In Revelation chapter 1, you have the things which were. That was John on the island of Patmos and his vision of the glorified Christ. That's the things that were. But then in Revelation chapter 2, you find the second section, and that's the things which are. And in chapter 3, chapter 4, you find the messages to the seven churches. That's a description of this church age in which we live. And then in Revelation chapter 4 to the end of the book, you have the things which shall be. This is future things. This is things that are yet in the future. And so in Revelation chapter 4, you come to the end of the church age in chapter 3 with the message to the church at Laodicea. And then in Revelation chapter 4, you hear there's this voice. It's the sound of a trumpet. And it says, come up hither. And John is caught up into the presence of the Lord God. And there in that throne room, the Bible says in verse number 10 that he sees four and twenty elders. Now, now who, are, who are these four and twenty elders? Uh, you remember when John saw the new Jerusalem later on in the book of Revelation chapter 21. When he saw the new Jerusalem, he saw that it had twelve gates. It has twelve gates. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 12. And on each gate is engraved the name of a tribe in the nation of Israel. Each of the 12 gates has engraved on it the name of one of the 12 tribes. You also find in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 14 that the new Jerusalem has 12 foundations. It has 12 foundations. And in each of the foundations is also engraved. And each of the foundations is engraved with the name of one of the 12 apostles. So, so 24 elders, I believe these are representative. They are representative of those people, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints. These are representative of the saints of all the ages. These are those saints from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. But, but notice what is going to be our privilege. What is going to be our privilege as we gather there around the throne? Revelation chapter 4 verse number 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Wow, what a privilege that will be. I mean, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Our works are going to be tried. And, 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 and oh, may God help us to, to see our works abide through the fire so that we will receive uh, a crown or maybe two crowns, maybe three crowns that, that, that we'll be able to receive. And, and then to have the privilege to come before the throne of our Savior, the one who loved us, the one who died for us, the one who saved us, and to be able to take those crowns that by grace... He has given to us, and, and then we're able to take them and just give them back to Him and lay them at His feet and say, you're worthy. I'm not worthy of this. I don't deserve any good thing. It's all by grace that I'm even here. You're worthy to receive all glory, all honor, and all power. Wonderful thing. Wonderful hope. Wonderful prospect. 
Sadly, there's another side to that coin. The other side of the coin is how shameful it will be for those who stand before the Lord. Saved? Yes. Have a home in heaven? Yes. But they have no crown to lay before Him. They have no crown to lay at the Savior's feet. How sad that's going to be. What, what, a, what a sad thing that will be. You know, it's interesting. We talk about in heaven, oh, God's going to wipe away all the tears. You better go back and read the book of Revelation again. God doesn't wipe away the tears until much later. I believe at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be some tears shed. There'll be tears shed when we realize how little we actually did for the Lord. There'll be tears shed when we realize just how much we could have done if we'd have just got our priorities right. Yeah, I think there's going to be tears shed at that judgment seat of Christ. And that's 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 why John, that's why John gives us a warning. First John chapter 2, verse number 28. Now little children abide in him. He's talking to Christians, talking to us. He says, Abide in him. That when he shall appear, when Jesus Christ comes again, that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. George Mueller, he said this, he said, so far as the rewards of grace are concerned in the world to come, there is an intimate connection between the life of the Christian here and the enjoyment and the glory of in the day of Christ appearing. In other words, the bottom line is, is that there's a connection between how we serve the Lord here and how we will enjoy heaven later on. There's a connection there. There's a connection. And when the Lord Jesus comes to take us home, uh, my prayer is that He will find all of us faithfully obeying Him, faithfully loving Him, faithfully serving Him so that we might receive that full reward that He desires to give to us. That we might receive those wonderful rewards that He gives to us and that then we have the privilege of giving back to Him as an act of worship. What a wonderful day it's going to be for some. Sad day for others. I hope we'll be one of those who are happy in that day. Lord, we thank you this evening for your word. And, and Lord, we, we thank you for these rewards that, uh, that you've so graciously promised. Lord, it's, it's an amazing thing that by grace you saved us. Then on top of that, you've promised by grace to even give us rewards for, for serving you. Lord, we certainly... We certainly have so much to be thankful for. I pray that you would forgive us for, for our failures to serve you as we ought to, for our failures to make, make our priorities line up with what you would have. Lord, I pray this evening that you would help us, as, first of all, to examine our hearts and make sure that we've truly been born again. But then also I pray that you would help us that we might, as Christians, determine that we're going to love you and serve you with all of our hearts we might receive that full reward and that we might have the privilege to lay it back at your feet and to give to you the worship that truly you do deserve. We pray now you would bless our time of prayer together and we pray that you would be honored and glorified in all that is done through the rest of this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.